No, I'd, I'd hate to burst people's bubble, but it's not as it's not as dramatic as people think. Would you ever get calls from agents to let them to let you know that their player is looking for a move or open oh. to a loan deal or something? All the time, yeah. all the time. And, and if you've done your work properly, um, it, it shouldn't be frantic. Like it can get a little bit edgy towards the end of the day. Obviously, if you're trying to get a player over the line. And I think it's the market's probably only going to get bigger. Logistically, that brings in its own problems. But you, it's opened up the South American market. I do a job that I love doing mm. uh, in a sport that I, I love watching uh, mm. in terms of that. So it's from, from my point of view, it's, it's a passion probably more than, more than a job. Hello and welcome back to my channel and as you can tell from the title it's time for another industry chat video. So today is a bit of a special one so the guest today is Andy Belk who is currently the head of recruitment at championship team Queen's Park Rangers. So Andy initially started off as an analyst and actually is the reason that I work in analysis today. So it's a long story which we will get into the conversation but yeah effectively Andy was the reason that I kind of took the route into a career in analysis. So we'll chat about that, we'll chat about how Andy worked abroad for a period of time and how he then transitioned from analyst to sort of recruitment and then now obviously head of recruitment. Um, we've got loads of questions kind of there's a few submitted from you guys actually in terms of what goes on during a transfer, how to kind of take that route that Andy's done in terms of become sort of in the recruitment world and scouting and all the things that go with that, how much ro role data plays it in the actual transfer of players um, and all the things from sort of agents to directors of football, etc. So without further ado, let's get into the chat with Andy Belk. Good morning, Andy. Welcome to the channel. How are you doing today? Morning. Yeah, I'm very good. Thank you. You? Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. I'm very good. It's a very wet day in Doncaster today, so I don't know what it's like where you are, but it's it's a grim day today. So yeah, it's pretty grim down here as well. <laughs> so first of all, really appreciate you jumping on, Andy. Obviously, I've been trying to get you a while, but both schedules have kind of not permitted it to to go ahead until now. So really pleased to to finally get you on and, and have a chat. So I started the the video with a brief introduction from from myself, but obviously I like to pass it over to the, to the guest. So for those that don't know who you are, Andy, so who are you? What are you currently doing? And again, we'll del we'll delve deeper into how you got there, moving on, but just kind of what you're doing at the moment. Yeah, well, I'm Andy Belk. My current role is uh, head of recruitment at QPR. I uh, know we'll probably go into this, but I've been at the club 14 years now. I think it is. It's a long time. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's my current role. I've done various roles going, going getting to that role, uh, which I'm sure we'll touch on. Yeah, yeah, that was going to say I've got your LinkedIn profile up, and I was trying to. It seems you've been professionally employed as an analyst for about 15 years now. Because you said you've most of that, the majority of that is at QPR, so you're probably part of the furniture at this point. So um, before we kind of get into the nitty gritty, I do want to bring up because again, people that have watched some of my other videos you may have seen in a previous one that I mentioned one of the reasons that I kind of got into analysis was one of my teachers at the time you know had a brother who worked at a club who kind of sorted me out with some work experience and stuff so you are that guy Andy so your brother so for those that don't know you Andy's brother a PE teacher um when I was at school that was what introduced me to analysis so I didn't really know much about what it was and whether these jobs actually existed. Um, Andy was kind enough to come in and do a bit of a presentation to the class. And then that was kind of from then it was, okay, this is what I want to do. And, and like I say, Andy was kind enough to let me do bits and pieces with him just to kind of basically help me out and get my foot in the door really. So yeah, probably might not be um, where I am today without without the help of you, Andy. So appreciate it. <laughs> <that. laughs> so, it's a long time ago. It's, 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 it's a very long time ago, time. definitely. So, um, okay, so back to going back all the way to your education then, Andy, because again, there's there's loads of these courses, sports analysis, master's courses, um, even undergrad courses that are specific for analysis these days, but I'm sure it wasn't that that popular back when, when you started. So you did your undergrad at Worcester, didn't you? I think it says on your thing. So yeah. was was any of that analysis, was was it much? And how did you kind of get into the analysis from that point? Yeah, I think I think when when I went to uh, Worcester at uni, um, it was I'll be honest, I didn't really know what I wanted to do at that point. Uh, and I liked sport, I liked PE, and you know, sports and exercise science seemed the logical choice. Uh, I'll be honest, at the time, it was probably to buy myself a little bit more time because I had no idea what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it probably took me up until late on in my second year. Um, 
to to, to realize we we happen to do a module in um uh can't remember the exact title of the module. I think it's sports analysis or performance analysis or something. We did a module in it. Mm. Uh, and and it, I think it was only a six, seven week module. And and instantly I was I was hooked, if you like. It it was it was something I really enjoyed doing. I I, it, I would have liked the module to continue a little bit longer, to be honest. It seemed to go very by quite quickly. Mm. Um so so ever since that point, I thought you know what, this is probably something I want to do. And it was still relatively new in professional sport. Not many clubs, in fact, I don't think any at that stage had had a full-time analyst. Yeah. Um, so then going into my third year, I did my dissertation on performance analysis, actually tennis, um, but performance analysis at the, at the time. Um, and then I knew, I realised this is probably something I want to go in. But I'll be honest, at the time, I, I had no idea how to get into it. Yeah. Uh, it was still relatively new. Um, I don't really think clubs themselves knew exactly what it was. Yeah. Um, so I, I went on to, I, I took a year out, then went back to do a, a master's at, at UIC, um University of Wales Institute, Cardiff, it was it was called at the time. Yeah. Um, and to my knowledge at the time, that was the only master's course in sports performance analysis. Um, I, I believe I was the, the second year of intake of students, I think. Um, so, so I did a full year on that. Uh, I was lucky enough at the time to manage to work at Cardiff City, um, uh, filming games and doing that sort of stuff because that, that generally back then was 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 the analyst thing, really. The primary thing was, was to film games and, and code it, if you like. Um, and I think at the, at the start, that the first year I mentioned there of UIC and the, the second year that I went into, I think. If you look through professional football, even still now, um, most of in that course are involved in some sort of professional sport. Not all football, yeah. um, but some sort of analysis in sport. We, we that whole group seems to have developed through football, really, or or, or any sport. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that was my academic thing, really. Uh, then I was. Um, fortunate enough to to go and work for Prozone in their office. Um, where obviously they were the leading company at the time. Mm. Uh, it just so happened to be based in Leeds, which obviously benefited me because it was 45, 50 minutes from, from home. Yeah. Um, so I, I was fortunate enough to work work in their office for a year and, and just get an understanding. I was probably learning on the job, real. I was definitely learning on the job. And I, to an element, everybody still is. <laughs> uh, it's so we were. Yeah, I was I was fortunate enough to do that. I was, I suppose, the support analyst for the analysts that were already in the club. So yeah. I was in a privileged position where I could, I could almost see what every other analyst was doing to a certain degree, not not day to day basis. So I think that helped me learn a lot, really. Yeah, uh, things I liked, things I didn't really like. Um, so I could almost learn in the background. Yeah. Uh, and I presume that that would have given you you were speaking to those analysts as well in the clubs. You were, were you, was that part of your role? So you were getting to know the analysts within the clubs at that point. Uh, a little bit, not not too much. It was sort of going through somebody else and then coming down to me, and then I was doing the work really. But um, I was I was fortunate enough, and and a lot of I learned from a lot of great analysts at the time. It was obviously uh, Bolton at the time. Yeah. Uh, were, were the leaders in this, if you like. Uh, mm. And obviously, most, if not all of them, have gone on to do mm. very, very good things in 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 the world of football and, and yeah. still continue to do so. Yeah. Um, so so that was good. Uh, it was more association by name, really. I, you know, they knew my name, I knew their name. And yeah. so then further down the path, when, you know, you meet at conferences or something, it's you see names and and yeah. you've already made an introduction really without making an introduction yeah yeah that i mean that's interesting because the the whole module that you said you did um, a six weeks module in in year two that was pretty much the same as what i did and obviously i'm a couple of years behind you because I, I think i might have emailed you while i was at uni and the uic thing was a uh, because i applied for because i again i was thinking well what do i do to get this job that i want in analysis and i think it was probably a case of you know, well, does this master's, like you said, I know Andy's done that master's, so let me check it out. So I applied for that master's. I didn't actually end up doing it. So I don't have a master's, but I did kind of go down that route. So I know it's not not for everyone, but I kind of um, ended up doing something different in the end. But um, yeah, your kind of guidance was was useful. So 
after you've kind of done them, then you've got you've got a bit of a random one where you've gone out to Dubai and kind of done done it in there for a club. So did that come about? I, I presume did that come about via like pros and because pros, as you say, they were the leads at the time. Was that then? they were out there with the clubs and they wanted an analyst out there. Did it, is that kind of how it worked? Yeah. Yes. It was, it was, to be honest, they, it was almost, a, um, yeah, that they, they, they worked for clubs and, and then they put analysts into, into clubs, but you still technically employed by pro zone, but obviously it was out in, in the middle East. When I was out there, they had three clubs. Right. Uh, I, I was at Al Nasser. Um, there was Al Jazeera and Al, Al Wada. Uh, I think with the other two clubs, yeah. just off my head a long time ago. Um, it, yeah, so it was good. I, I I'd ended up doing a full season out there. Um, I really enjoyed it, to be honest. It, <laughs> I had to learn a lot very quickly. I had to do a lot of growing up, really, if you like, because uh, I was literally on my own. Uh, yeah. I, obviously, there was two more analysts out there, but they were based in Abu Dhabi. I yeah. was based in Dubai. So although it was only an hour down the road, I could still contact them. But fundamentally, I was I was on my own, and I, I had to work it out. I had to work out not just that a language barrier. Yeah. Um, obviously, the 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 coach has chopped and changed a lot out out there. I think I had five in that in that season, um, and all different nationalities. Um, yeah. So it, it was quite good for me, really. Um, I. I almost, I think when I first went, the, the coaches were Brazilian. Uh, they, were, they were brilliant, to be fair. I really enjoyed working with them. But I tried to teach myself Portuguese while I was out there um, just to try and help out with the communication. Yeah. Uh, they all spoke English. They were great. Um, they were great for me. But it's so not just in terms of learning on the job and the analysis stuff. It was, I was trying to fit in really, um, which I think went a long way with, with probably their mindset because. All they they knew someone coming in. They, they an English guy was coming in. I they didn't know me. I didn't know them. So yeah. it, it was it was trying little bits to help to fit in to to go that extra mile. Which which I think is probably something I've taken on board going throughout my career. Really, I think yeah. try and do everyone try and do as much as they can in terms of helpful stuff. Uh, which which I think in this industry can 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 help out a lot. How how did the language learning go, Andy? Can you can you give us a bit of Portuguese or no? <laughs> I wish I could. I wish I could. It was very much football Portuguese, and and I'm a little bit embarrassed and ashamed to say as it stopped. Uh, and I could probably say one or two words now, but that's that that's about it. It's I wish I would have continued. Yeah. yeah. Any other any other languages since then, Andy, or, or no? No, I I always dabble with a few languages. I'll be honest, it finding the time is, is very difficult at the moment. I yeah. I would love to speak another language fluently, uh, yeah. just my own own personal development. Really, probably nothing to do with work. It's mm-hmm. I think it. I am one of those people. I think uh, I think you you're always trying to learn, and I think uh, for me, another language would be brilliant. Yeah, yeah, same. Very very much similar. So. That that was you there for a year. So was it always the intention to come back after a year, or was it just the contract ended and you came back, or were you kind of getting a bit homesick? Or no, no, no. I, I was planning on staying. To be honest, uh, we they were talking about renewing the pro zone contract for the next year. Uh, I I was all geared up for staying. Um, my my girlfriend at the time, who is now my my wife, um, was planning on moving out to Dubai. Mm. Um, so it was. It was probably two, three weeks away from from happening, and, and I'd have been happy. I, I I really enjoyed my time out in Dubai. It was mm-hmm. it was it was good for me. It was very good, and uh, everything about the place I, I like. Um, but yeah, it, at the time that the QPR job came up, um, and it was always one of my goals to try and work not just in English football, but try and work in the Premier League. Obviously, they weren't in the Premier League at the time. Yeah. But, it was always one of my goals to do that. And so it was always in the back of my mind. Many things, as much as I would have loved to stay, I could still come back home, see the family, um, get a step closer to trying to work in the Premier League. Yeah. Um, so it all came about very quickly, to be honest. And within probably 10 days, I was I was back home and, uh, yeah, just about ready to start for QPR. 
So who who was the QPR manager? And were they in the championship at the time? Yeah, they're they're in the championship. Uh, Ian Dowie was the manager. He'd just taken over that summer. Um, yeah. And and I think I, I think I by the time I came in, they might have already played two games. I think off the top of my head, and, and believe it or not, my actual first game for QPR was home against Doncaster. Oh, was um, it? Yeah. yeah, which was yeah, which was a bit ironic, uh, but. Yeah, so Ian Dowie's the manager. He just started at that time. So what were you going into at that point then? You said back then it was not what it's like now. So was there a department at that point? Were you the guy, the only guy, or were you joining somebody else? At no, I, 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 was the, I was the only guy. Um, Ian Dowie used it previously at Coventry. Uh, yeah. So when he came into QPR, he obviously wanted um, to continue. He'd got used to it. He, he was very, He was very good at that sort of stuff, very good forward thinker in terms of of using analysis at that time because there was still a lot of clubs that weren't um well mo- most clubs weren't at that stage certainly in the championship so yeah it, it was walking in it was they hadn't there was nothing in place um th- throughout the club so it was literally starting from scratch um mm-hmm. on my own a, a guy with a laptop and uh, filming games and mm-hmm. yeah trying to Trying to start everything for that, but 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 that was good. It was really good. I enjoyed that. Um, it, it helped with having people around the club that saw the value in it. Mm. Uh, so it, it made the transition for me a little bit easier. Yeah, and and so how long did it take for that department to to grow? Did you did it take several years of you working on your own, or did you kind of how long until another analyst came in? Pretty much. Yeah, I think it was probably two maybe three years two and a half years of, of working on my own uh yeah. and then it had grown and the demands were starting to grow for analysis so i i brought in an, an intern um so we, we had an intern and i think that went on for not the same intern but went on for probably another year and a half two years yeah uh, then the <clears throat> went full t- that person went full time then we brought in another intern and it snowballed from there, really, and I think most clubs now, all the way down the age groups, uh, have some sort of analysis. Whether it's full time, obviously, the without touching on it too much, the the E Triple P um, obviously demands for, for analysts. So it's um, yeah, it, it's grown tremendously since I started. Yeah, and I think the the actual role of the analyst has obviously evolved a lot since then as well. Like you. You mentioned like back then it seemed you were employed basically as well when you were abroad you were employed by Prozone pretty much so you they would they put you in and then it was a case of you know you'd the role that you have to do as an analyst then was filming and encoding that's kind of all you all you would do but now a lot of that's done for you from external companies and and technology that you can get now so it kind of leads me on to another question like coaching qualifications and, and how I mean are, are, do you have any coaching I know you're not really an analyst are you more in recruitment but do you have any, and did that ever cross your mind to think, you know, I think this would benefit me or anything? Uh, I, I don't have any coaching qualifications. It, it's something I probably would wish I had, would like to have. I, certainly now, uh, I think I think it would benefit the analyst role a lot because if you look at the analysts now, that they're, they're almost um, coaches, really, yeah. just not on field coaches, really. They they are technical coaches really if you like um they are um yeah so I, I think it would it does help the the analysts now they're they're probably much more seen as as within the coaching group rather than um, an add-on if you like or rather than a the help if should I say for the want of a better phrase yeah yeah and, and you're now seeing more of the kind of niche jobs of you know like set piece analyst and, and transition analyst or you know things like that whereas Back in the day, it was a case of one man did as much as he can, but now they're, they're seeing the benefits of all. You know, the clubs are seeing what can be done, so they they are opening out more positions. Um, yeah, I think in <clears throat> even the co- the coaches coming through now. Uh, obviously, you see more and more younger coaches coming through that they have come probably through academies and that sort of stuff. So they've they almost have an analytical background in them themselves. Um, they're all well, most I'm sure are more than capable of um analyzing games through various softwares or something like that so it makes sense for the analyst to do the other side of it if you know so they then 
bringing a bit of coaching or coaching background into their role, whereas the coaches have all already brought in the analyst role into their background. Yeah. So I think I think gone are the days where it's um, the coach is the coach, the analyst is the analyst. It's there's always going to be that hybrid, and I think I think it's got much better and much closer as it's uh, over the years. Yeah, definitely, hundred percent agree. So. I know people that will want to watch want to speak about the recruitment side of things. We'll get into that in a sec. One thing before that, um, Andy, is on your LinkedIn, you've got that you did some work with the Irish FA. So that was kind of, was that alongside QPR and you were working with, was it one of the one of the youth teams? Yes, it, it was. Uh, it was alongside QPR. So um, most, well, every international break, I would be away with Northern Ireland under 21s. Um, originally, the, the manager was Jim Magilton. Uh, who I knew from QPR, we'd worked together at QPR. Um, yeah. So we already had that relationship. Um, and and I, I thank Jim for that, taking me in. I, I always enjoy working with Jim. Uh, so he, he brought me in uh, for the first campaign, which I think is 18 months. Um, mm -hmm. And he stepped aside and, and the new manager was uh, Ian Barraclough, uh, who I got on great with, with Ian uh, and appreciate him for, for keeping me in that role. Uh, obviously, Ian then went on to do the, the senior team. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it, it was the analyst for the under-21s, which was which was good for me because, it, you know, you were travelling around seeing the elite under-21s, really. Um, you know, we were, we, we play many big teams. We were, I would say, fortunate, but that's probably doing the lads a disservice. We went away to Spain. Uh, with uh, they were an all star team and we we beat them over there, mm. uh, and and that campaign we were we were unfortunate to we we just missed out on qualifying. Uh, I think we came third, but we were very close to coming second. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that that was alongside QPR. Um, it it was good for me because obviously I I could see elite players over in Europe uh, as well as. Around that time, I was sort of making the crossover on into the recruitment side. Yeah. Uh, it, it sort of when I first started, I was the analyst. When when towards the end, I was definitely in the recruitment side. Yeah. So it also helped me really because I could then see um, the the up and coming players across Europe. Um, yeah. I did that. I think it was six years in total. You mustn't have been at home very much, Andy. So, I mean, I'm surprised your missus is still... You must not have been... Yeah. The, the, the championship season is is as bad anyway. And then when you get time off for the international break, you're you're going off to, to Ireland as well. So Yeah. Unfortunately, my role, that's not changed too much. I'm, yeah. I'm quite often on planes, trains and automobiles. So I'm very fortunate to have a very understanding wife and family. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So you, you touched upon that. That was kind of the initial bit of the transition to recruitment. So it was one of the, one of the topics that comes up when I speak to other analysts is like the progression of the analyst. So what kind of, where do you go after being first team analyst? You can then obviously head up an analysis department, but then where do you kind of go after that? So, you know, I've kind of spoke to others that have gone into more like maybe technical director roles or like, you know, almost like a director of the sport that they're in. And obviously recruitment is, a, is another side of that. So was that, why recruitment was it something that you just thought you know you had an interest in you you kind of thought that you'd done enough of the analyst role and you wanted to you wanted to change how did how did it come about yeah a, a bit of both really i think I, I it was never something when i started as an analyst it, it was never something i saw myself going into recruitment partly because certainly at the time the recruitment analyst role or or that side of it didn't exist. It, it it was only in the last few years that 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 role has started to to come about. Mm. It, yeah, I, I think I, I was at a time in my personal life where I think we I just I think we just had our first child, um, and it just seemed like I, I was ready for a change. Mm. Um, probably a little bit naively thinking I might get to spend more time at home, uh, <laughs> which certainly isn't the case. But it, yeah, I think, I think in terms of the analysts that had gone in, we'd built the department. It was fully functioning. And in my opinion, one of the, one of the better ones, uh, I'm, I'm obviously biased. So I am going to say that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think it, it got to the point where I was ready for the change. And 
I, I was fortunate enough to speak to uh, Les Ferdinand about it, who was the director of football. Um, and it's something he wanted to progress on the recruitment side um, and, and try and make it more, uh, I would say analytical, scientific, it, more, but, but that's probably the wrong word. It was to try and, to give it more depth, should we say? Uh, yeah. Probably to try and give it give it more depth and more somebody based in the club that you know watch could watch players and that sort of stuff, and probably gave it a bit more of a focal point. So the, the club didn't have anybody at that time, um, or or anything like that. So it seemed just for for me and the club just a natural progression. Yeah. So you, the, the, you initially was scouting coordinator. That was like the the first kind of role you had. Is it so? Because again, like I'm presuming it was a similar to role that my friend George was at Brighton in terms of you know you kind of send you know you're organising which games are being watched. You may be watching games yourself as well, but you're also kind of coordinating the rest of the scout scouting department. Um, so that kind of was the initial entry to the the scouting in QPR then for you, Andy. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was to, to have the central hub, really, in terms of that. So it was, um, as well as doing that and building databases on the players, collecting the reports, it was obviously watching the videos of players um, yeah. and and building it up that way, really. Just, just so, I suppose, it was a more focused approach, uh, which I, I say quite a lot when I, when I do some of these talks. So it was trying to make it more focused in terms of, things they were they knew where they were going and what, what games they were watching and which players yeah. they were watching rather than a bit more sporadic yeah yeah okay so and you did that for what did you do that for a couple of years before you eventually got promoted to head of recruitment yeah it was oh, three years something like that uh yeah. and then the, the the club decided to have a um structural rechange i suppose it is um and then yeah i would i was fortunate enough enough to for the club to to see me as somebody who could step into that role so yeah and i've been doing that now since what would that be now three years i think i think my first window was covid i think so yeah. that would be three years ago or something like that yeah so and then you mentioned les ferdinand was he director of football throughout that is he he's still director of football now isn't he so is he how long has he been there has he been up throughout all of your recruitment time there then Yes, he has. I think I think he said the other day he's been at the club eight years, I think, in this role. Um uh, yeah. I think he came in as head of football and then the title got changed to director of football, but fundamentally it's the it's yeah. the same role. Yeah. So for those that you know a bit, you know, unsure of what does a director of football do? What does what does Les actually do and how does that coincide with what you do? What kind of working relationship do you have with Les? Yeah, I have a very good working relationship with Les. Uh not not just working relationship, you know, we we're very good friends as well. So it's um it something we've developed over time. Um we yeah we we speak a lot. I often joke I probably speak to him more than I speak to my wife. Uh it yeah so he's I, I think just touched on the director of football role in general. I think I think it's a very misunderstood role in 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 English football. It, it not so much in the continent because it's 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 been there longer and the structures are probably slightly different in in European clubs than they are in in English clubs. Yeah. So I think the director of football is very misunderstood in England. It's and there is no set. This is what a director of football does because I think if you went and asked ten directors of football, they'd all give you the fundamentally the 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 things would be the same, but they would also be it wouldn't be exactly the same. Yeah. Uh, so you know without. Talking for Les, I think you know his role obviously is overseeing, as it says, the the football side of, of the club. Mm. Um, obviously, a lot of director of football that the, probably the bulk of it gets spoke about in terms of recruitment. Mm. Um, obviously, the, the the big focal point goes on director of football, the, the two transfer windows throughout throughout the year. Yeah. Um, so that is obviously a big bulk of part of the director of football, but it's not it's not just that it's. He's speaking to obviously in constant contact with the managers and the coach, medical side, make sure that everything is working as it should, everything is pulling in the same direction. The, the transition from academy to first team football, uh, making sure that's all aligned. Yeah. Uh, the, the philosophy of how the club wants to play, how they want to be, how they want to act. So yeah. it's a big role. Uh, it's, it's, 
it's a tough role. Uh, I think it's one of those roles where you don't really get a lot of thanks. Yeah. If I'm being honest, it's people are certainly in England are quick to criticize a director of football, but uh, I, I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand what the, the role necessarily is. Uh, yeah. And uh, Les has done a fantastic job at, at QPR. If you look when he came in, uh, I think at the time, I think I'm right in saying we were probably just about to drop out the Premier League, I think, when he first started, uh, obviously with big budgets um, and uh, big name players. And, you know, to restart the whole club, um, bring the finances back into a semi-reasonable order mm. and maintain the club's competitive instinct and competitive edge I, I think a lot he deserves a lot of credit yeah just just a question on that because again you've said the director of football and I agree get a lot of stick in, in England so in terms of how transfers have changed over the years so you know back in the day it would have been the manager just picked who he wants to, to sign and now it seems that that's you know rightly or wrongly it's not down to the manager it's down to the whether it's the director of football or the, the team so you know if the manager then goes the players and the signings that have come in are not just then, you know, old news. It's sort of like for the club as a whole. So, what what are you what are your thoughts on that, um, Andy? In terms of, you know, how how much say does the manager have in signings, and in terms of who, where are these signings initially coming from? Are they coming from a team, you know, like a team of scouts and, and the director of football and his network, or is it an, or is it a mixture of the two in terms of the manager's recommendations? Yeah, it's very much a mixture. Obviously, I can only really speak for for QPR. Um, myself, Les, and, and Mick uh, have a very, a very close relationship. Uh, we we speak continuously. Um, I think f- fundamentally, is, and we always say there there is no point Les bringing in a player that the manager doesn't want. Yeah. Uh, financially, it doesn't make sense. We don't have the budget. If the manager doesn't want them, they they aren't going to play. Yeah. And that is a waste of finances. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're effectively wasting a lad's career as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so in terms of how it works, is we we all speak about the player, myself, Mick, and Les, and, and fundamentally, we all try and agree if we if we can. Mm-hmm. Um, I think generally the way we see players so far, obviously, we've only had one window since Mick's come through the door. We see football and we see players are very similar, all, all three of us, uh, w- which helps. In terms of getting to the final player, it, we obviously, the, as the recruitment department, are out and about looking at players. So we make our recommendations. Les might make his recommendations. Mick will make his recommendations. And we'll, we'll sit down and talk about them. And, yeah. and we, we will try and always pick the best player that we think will fit into QPR that we can afford. Um, yeah. We we sometimes we disagree. Uh, you know, Mick might not like him, I might not like him, Mez might not like him, but it's it's all done with the best intentions. Yeah. Uh, and we're all trying to get, we all want QPR to be successful. So we won't, we're not going to do anything that undermines that. Yeah. I think obviously the relationship you described that you've got with Les, like you're, I'm sure you probably kind of think the similar things now anyway with, you know, the club inside out and you've kind of got that trust that you've built over the, the years. So you're probably going to be thinking about players in a similar way anyway. Um, so, yeah, that's that's interesting. So and next next kind of question, uh, Andy, again, say what you can say. Obviously, I know some of that you might not be able to, but what does the recruitment department actually look like at QPR? Then if you're at the top, are you kind of overseeing a number of scouts in this country, do you have do you have recruitment analysts as well? Like how do how does it currently look? Yeah, we we have uh, under me we have uh, several um, full time scouts, a couple of part time scouts, and, and a couple of um, uh, recruitment analysts. Um, the recruitment analysts, well, there, there there is a couple of them. There's two of them. One one is probably more video based and tracking the reports if 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 you like um and and the other one is probably more data orientated um that's they obviously both cross over but i think if i asked them both that question that would be their answers uh that's just the way naturally it's it's transpired um 
we, in terms of we at the moment we don't have anybody based abroad as scouts. We we tend to fly in and out or right. trains in and out, driving out, however that may be. Yeah. Um, just because obviously with and I'm sure we'll probably touch on it, Brexit and the GB points. Obviously, that's it, it's dramatically reduced yeah. the, the pools of players that certainly as a Championship club can go in and go in and attract. Yeah. So. Yeah. From a from a financial point of view, um, we thought it would be best to do it this way. Um, obviously, we that doesn't necessarily mean we we fly out here, there, and everywhere and just go to random games. We do a lot of work before somebody yeah. steps on a plane or steps on a train, yeah. uh, whether that be data or video. Um, so we do a lot of work that. So, like I said earlier, it's it's a more focused approach rather than. Being a bit gung ho, if you like, because every time we we go abroad, the, the club have to pay for it. Yeah, uh, you know, and, it, and trips aren't even if it's just a weekend aren't aren't cheap. Mm. Uh, so it's something we're very conscious of. So certainly, certainly as a club, because unfortunately we 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 can't always match financially clubs in in this division. So we we need to be smarter. We need to try and work a little bit cleverer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, because when I was, I mean, it was an in well, when I first left uni, I went down to Brighton, did like an internship there, and half of that was in the recruitment department. And again, like you said, it wasn't much of a thing back then. So this is going back ten years or so. So I spent half the season doing similar to what you probably described that your recruitment analysts do in terms of video base, in terms of like clipping players and creating presentations and stuff, but also then just like sifting through data and you know the the amount of data that's out there and. It's interesting that you can kind of, you know, find someone that you may have never ever heard of or seen, but then the data can point you in that direction. Then you can take a closer look, and then it might be that you know you've had that look on video, and it might then progress to, you know, I think we want to send a scout out to this guy because he's probably worth a look, and then it kind of works its way up the food chain. So, um, if you, if you're able to, Andy, just kind of let's just a scenario just to kind of talk us through what what how a transfer kind of goes ahead. So let's say QPR are after a left back in the next window. What you know? How does what does how does that start? What kind of conversations are had at the, the initial? Do you have a like um, a list of go to left backs anyway that you're always kind of monitoring? And, and how would it kind of progress throughout the cycle to to actually signing that player? Yeah, I think uh, obviously, firstly, is, is obviously identifying the position in terms of what um, Mick or, or you know Les Les will want. It's it's one of those we we have conversations, not necessarily just for this window. We're always talking one, two, and sometimes three windows ahead. Uh, yeah. Obviously, because of players' contracts or people are going to get interest in in you know, so it's something we always need to be aware of. We try and make it as um, proactive as we can. Uh, yeah. Obviously, there is an element of reactivity because you're never quite sure what other clubs are going to do um, yeah. in terms of attracted to your players which is a good thing for us because mm-hmm. it shows we're probably doing something right yeah um so so once the the position is identified really we, we always know roughly where we are in terms of financial budget yeah. uh so we obviously that massively plays a part because you can rule out a lot of players already yeah. um yeah we, we in terms of the thing we, we're constantly monitoring and watching players maybe not for this window or maybe the next window or the one window after or even the window after that if you know their contracts are coming to an end uh you know so sometimes you need to be patient in terms of players uh and you might have to wait one two windows to get them before they can fit into financially or or um or they've developed enough to come in and, and start really um so yeah we in in our don't don't think I'm talking out of turn here, but in the recruitment office in in, in the training ground, um, the, we have whiteboards or whiteboards all over the walls um, yeah. with players' names on and and that sort of stuff, and they're constantly moving around in out, um, you know, off and on, and you yeah. know, depending on that. So we constantly have a, a revolving door, really, in terms of. These, if we need a left back, these are the ones we're thinking. If we need a right back, whatever. If we, if it needs to be on loan, these are who we're thinking. If we have money, yeah. if it's out of contract. So 
it, it constantly evolves that some players are on there for for a long time because we know if they come up in window one, two, three, then it's obviously we, we would be interested. Mm-hmm. Um, so so that's how that that works in terms of that. Um, constantly trying to speak to their representatives um, just to try and keep the information constant and, and current, really, obviously. It, you know, especially if they're if they might be coming out on loan or they're out of contracts, you know, are they close to signing a new contract? And in which case they need to come off the out of contract board because yeah. we are not necessarily out of contract anymore. Yeah. Um so in terms of that, uh yeah, so it's 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 a long process. Um it's but it's it's a continual process, really. I think we always try and find try to work as far ahead as we can as possible because it gives you a amount of time. I think if you try and work window to window, it, it, it's very reactive. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, you can end up making quite a few mistakes. Mm. Yeah, I think it is quite a, like as you described. You've got to be kind of fluid because you might have a list of left backs that you might you know consider for the future, but then you might get you know your left back might get you might get a bad injury and two bad injuries and you need to bring that forward and see who's available right now. And half that list probably aren't available right now. So then you've got to kind of adapt and, or have you got someone that can come up from the academy that can do the job and, and stuff like that. So you, you mentioned there kind of speaking with their representatives. Is that something that you would do as head of recruitment or is that more of a Les job in terms of speaking with agents and things like that? Uh, to be honest with you, myself, Les and Mick, we, we all speak to agents really. It's not, um, I might be more the initial side of it, really. Uh, yeah. And then when it, it goes further up in terms of negotiating and stuff, that's where Les and the CEO Lee yeah. do it, really. But between us, we, we all speak to agents. We All three of us have probably, well, we have. We've all been in the game a long time now. So we 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 all, we know probably most of the agents. We Some we have better relationships with than others. It's... I might have a good relationship with an agent. So if if the player comes up with that agent, it makes sense for me to call them. If, yeah. if there's one that Les knows more, then it makes sense for Les to call him because he's already got that in- relationship and same with Mick. Yeah. So it's not a case of I speak to him or Les speaks to him or Mick speaks to him. It's, yeah. it's we, we all do it. And yeah. depending on which agent it might be, it, if we have a, already have a relationship with them, you, it's an easier conversation than cold calling. Yeah, and then would you ever get calls from agents to let them to let you know that their player is looking for a move or open oh. to a loan deal or something? All the time, all yeah. the time. Uh, yeah. Certainly, in well, it's it's starting to ramp up now. Obviously, with we're building into January, but once you get into December, uh, and in even over the Christmas time, Christmas Day, whatever it is, mm-hmm. it, uh, and and that's fundamentally the the agents' jobs. You know, that's why they're employed by players. If if they want to move their player, then it, it, they need to try and get the name out there. We, as a club, though, we, as I say, we, we're very proactive in terms of that. So we, we would like to think we probably already know about the player, and we've gone to the agents rather than a speculative call. The agent coming to us really. Yeah. There's always cases where that, sorry, excuse me. There's always cases where that might happen. Certainly on a loan. Certainly yeah. at the end of the window, because you know if. If a player's on loan, sorry, if a player plays for a Premier League club as a left back, say, and they go and sign a left back in the window, that left back then knows he isn't going to play. So, but he might not know until the last two days of the window. So that's where it becomes handy. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So, so then let's kind of touch upon deadline days and things like that. So, first question probably, are they as kind of manic as they're, they're made out to be on Sky Sports News because it's a bit of a dramatic thing. So, if you are being as proactive as you say you are and that, that must they must be relaxed times for you or is it is it kind of obviously things pop up and stuff but can you describe the or even you've had an experience where a deadline day was just a bit a bit mental uh no I'd, I'd hate to burst people's bubble but it's not as it's not as dramatic as people think it, it you know I, I think the film is it draft day or something like that it's it's mm-hmm. like that it's it's all very. It, I'll be honest. There's a lot of sitting around, yeah. uh, and it's a lot of time on the phone. Um, in terms of that, it, it's not frantic. It's not. 
it's not a lot of shouting. It's not like um, it's not like the stock exchange or anything like that. It's it's a it is on the phone, but you know, there's fundamentally there's probably very few players that come up on deadline day that you didn't already know that were going to come up. Yeah. Um, and and if you've done your work properly, um, it it shouldn't be frantic. Um, it certainly probably for for my my role really i think in it can get not frantic it can get a little bit edgy towards the end of the day obviously if you're trying to get a player over the line mm. it might have been building up for two three days but you, you might need to wait for either the parent club to sign someone so you you're waiting on that and yeah. then you're getting knocked down the, the chain if you like mm. so you, you're always conscious of the the clock yeah but it's not it's not frantic it's not it, it it's uh it's not as frantic as the media have, have, yeah. have portrayed it yeah i'm sure Sorry it's to a people's bubble <laughs> so just going back to the, the example you, you mentioned andy so you, you let's say you're tracking a, a list of players you might then reach out to their representatives if then you want to go ahead and basically go forward with one of them is it a case of QPR would then contact the club and say, you know, we want to make an offer or is it all done via agents these days? What would the next step be in terms of if you've identified that player and you're interested and you want to take it to the next step, what does that then look like? No, we we, we always try and do things correctly, to be honest. I'm, I'm sure every club does. I'm not saying clubs don't. Uh, we, we, will, we will always go to the club um, and find out what, what they're thinking. Some, sometimes, I'll be honest, it, 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 it differs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and but yeah, we we Les or the CEO will will contact the club and say what well, you know, what are your plans with player X or yeah. can we take player X or what are you looking for for player X or can we make a bid and yeah and we try and do it correctly in terms of that we we're very open and transparent in terms of that because that that's just the way that we like to operate. That's the the. The kind of people we we try to be. Uh, we wouldn't like it if it's if it's done the other way around to us. Yeah. Um, so it's yeah that yeah that's that's just the way we try and do it. Yeah, and then so again briefly touched upon it with the role of the recruitment analyst and the data. So I suppose the next kind of topic really, Andy, is the role that data is playing now in in signing. So you've got some something in the club as you mentioned. So. Obviously, you're not probably going to sign a player solely on the data, but how is that now evolving the the process of signing a player, the fact that there's so much data out there, and how does that look differently to what it did maybe when you first started, for example? Yeah, I, th- I think in terms of now, it it it, it adds another, another layer of information, mm-hmm. um, if you like, rather than just... Um, say a scout report saying, oh, I think he's a good player and we should sign him. You know, mm-hmm. it, it adds another thing. I, th- I think, and, and I always say it, and any probably buddy who's probably heard me talk before probably gets sick of hearing me say it. Um, we would, I, I would run a mile from anybody who said, we sign players off data. Yeah. I, it, that's not what we do. We we use data and yeah. I, I am a big fan believer and big fan of of data from a, certainly in from a recruitment point of view but even from an analyst point of view mm. but we will not sign a player purely off data yeah it, it well I, I certainly wouldn't be it doesn't happen it's not something i'm comfortable with and i don't think anybody really is yeah. it, it, in terms of the in terms of the data yes there is a, a lot of data out there it, it's finding the data that best suits you mm. um, and, I've, and I've heard people say before well if everyone's using the data you're not all looking at the same players well mm. not no not really because what we're looking for in a player is very different to what another club might be looking for in a player yeah uh, it's all about finding what suit works best for you so I think the, the biggest thing is it's a thing I, I constantly talk about to to people in the club, the recruitment analysts is we need to be so clear in what our player profiles are. Yeah. Uh, not 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 necessarily from a data point at this point, but 
what is a QPR left back? What is a QPR right back? What what fundamentally do we want them to do? Yeah. And then once you have that list, you then can then add data to it. Yeah. Right. So if we want this is what these are the 10 things that are non-negotiable. This is what a QPR left back has to do. Mm. So then you add the data to it. It's like Right. Okay. And these are constant. The, the the data might constantly change because you might do it a few times and think, no, nah, I'm not sure about that. Mm-hmm. Or the top 10 players that it's flagging up in that position when we've seen them don't fit. So yeah. in which case, what is, which metric is wrong or which couple of metrics, or they might all be wrong Yeah. You know, to try and suit it. So it's right. So we trust the data in terms of flagging up players. So that that's the way we use it. Then we we um, and and I think to be fair, we we're as close as probably we've we've ever been in terms of that. Um, and then obviously it goes to the eye test, the video data, and and before anybody goes to watch them, and we make sure they're doing exactly what we need them to do. Um, in terms of that, and then skipping forward to the end, in terms of when, when we produce the evidence, if you like, of, of signing the player in terms of the player dossiers, which with all the reports and dossiers, are, I'll be honest with you, I don't think my dissertations was as... Was as uh, <laughs> some of them are like 30, 40 pages long. Yeah. Uh, not all words, obviously. There's there's yeah. graphics and stuff in there, but um, it, it a large chunk of it is data. Yeah. Um, not necessarily from... All from Matt, it's from match data, it's from predictive data. You know, the use we use AI stuff now. Um, it, it just like I say, it adds another layer. I think, and and the owners and the shareholders of the club want to know where their money's going, yeah. So they they can see all that. Well, it's 40 pages long, whether they read it all that's obviously their prerogative, but yeah. it's it's it just this is what you're buying, yeah. and I think twofold that it helps get through a player because it's like okay this isn't a case of well he's just a good player there's a lot of work gone into this and yeah. but also I think it helps reevaluate sometimes if a player comes in and necessarily doesn't do as well as you think they're going to do which it happens mm-hmm. you're signing human beings it happens yeah. um, hopefully it doesn't happen too often but it, it does happen it but it's a case of okay, let's go back and see what we said about them. Mm. Was there any red flags that we missed? Yeah. If not, was was the dossier as strong as we thought it was going to be? And and I think, and that helps you develop going forward for other windows. Yeah, yeah. That's the kind of the thing I find fascinating in in the whole recruitment is, like you said, there you are buying a human being that might not settle when they move across the country or to a different country altogether and you know they might be the best player in the team in Germany but they just don't fit your style of play or they don't fit into your model and you know it's interesting where you could sign a player and maybe they're you know you've heard people like obviously signing underperforming players but you can kind of see a role for them at your club and how your current self will complement them and potentially bring the best out of them so there's there's a hell of a lot that goes in so yeah I think signings will go wrong but the more information and research you can put in that's obviously your way of limiting the the failure so to speak so um because yeah, yeah I'd, sorry I, yeah i'd love to see and say signings won't go wrong but they you, you can do all the you can do all the background checks character mm-hmm. everything the scout reports the data but like you say f- fundamentally things things don't happen at many clubs uh, some clubs for a reason mm-hmm. and you and then that player could go somewhere else and be the player you thought they were going to be. Yeah. Or, or vice versa. We, you know, from the other side, we you have a very good player who goes somewhere else and doesn't do as well. It's mm. there's a lot goes off in in a personal lives that you don't see. Yeah. It's you know, in terms of that, there's people might have young families, might not settle, might have things going off at home that you're not aware of or you can't find out, or it's it's I would, yeah, I would love to say sit here and say it's um, it's very scientific and one plus one equals two and it, it's that simple. It, but it unfortunately isn't. Yeah, definitely. So, 
Um, one thing I've got noted down, Andy, is, and I think you, you mentioned it earlier, is, is Brexit and kind of overseas transfers. So what, and again, you say what you can or are allowed to say, um, how has Brexit impacted your job in terms of who you can bring in? You mentioned, obviously, you don't have scouts based abroad. Kind of how does that look as a club? And are there limitations to who you can sign? Can you just find someone that's playing in another country and bring them in? Uh, it's made it... Um... I always say it's made it easier and harder, really. Mm. It, um, excuse me. Um, in, in terms of that, because it, it's gave us, it's given us a, a another filter mm. in, in that sense. Saying um, for for those that don't know the the, the, the GB points or the Brexit rules, um, you need fifteen points to automatically qualify to come and play in England. Uh, you can go for the exemptions panel at, at twelve points, and. Without going into it, really, you get you get specific points for a what league they play in, how many minutes they've played, um, where that club finished in that league, um, and it, several leagues are putting bands, um, band one, two, three, etc. Mm. Uh, generally, band one is the big hitting um, leagues. You know yeah. the, the the leagues. But unfortunately, players aren't necessarily coming to the championship. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got band two, which is, to be honest, you're probably more of a market for, for most championship clubs, mm. uh, which still qualify, still should get 15 points. I think as you go further down the bands, that's where it starts to become yeah. tricky. Yeah. Um, so, so it rules out a lot of a lot of leagues. And when I said it's easier and harder by that, I mean is it almost directs you into certain leagues mm. um so but but the problem with that is it becomes harder because it's directed the whole of the championship into those leagues yeah, <laughs> so yeah. the pool of the players has got smaller mm. but now there's a lot of clubs after those players yeah um so it's it yeah you know, unfortunately it's it's not going to change um so so it is what it is but it's um it's it's made it more interesting. It it's like I say, the filter is stuff. It's the, the first thing now. If I get a centre foreign player, or we're at a game and, and a scout writes about a you know a potential player, mm. the first thing I go is is check a GBE calculator. Yeah, uh, which we have one in in house, and it's yeah. do they qualify or or do they at least make the exemptions panel? Yeah. If they don't. We will. We won't discard them if they're good enough, but we will put them to one side because they, might, they may if, be able to qualify in the future. Isn't it? Yeah, exactly. If they, if they, they might then move clubs or make an appearance for the first team or even yeah. make the bench for the first team. Their points change, and then suddenly they become in play. Um, yeah. And that's the 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 tricky thing, really. I think. There are exceptions as you go down the down the bands. Um, obviously, if they're internationals, um, at specific clubs, and then that all depends on on where their FIFA ranking is for an international uh, team. Yeah, um, it, it's it, it's quite complicated, but it's yeah, it's certainly made it interesting. So you know the band of kind of the twelve to fifteen or whatever that one that's kind of negotiable. Is that just a kind of a You've got to argue a case why you think this is okay, or does it go to a panel, or what? How, uh, how... It, it, my, we haven't done it yet, so my my understanding is it it goes to a panel, and you have to try and justify of why they yeah. should come and play in England, and and why there will be benefit beneficial to to come and live in England. Yeah, um, and I think you have to try and make 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 a case of that. I think, as I say, we we haven't done it. Um, that the players or the player that we we brought in comfortably qualified. So um it's not something we've we've had to worry about at the moment. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. So then that's kind of your European, your kind of Brexit impact. So when we go kind of further afield, is that when you said about the world ranking? So if you get let's say you get told about a player that's playing in Argentina, has he got to then hit certain criteria for him to even be able to get a permit to work to, to come and play in England? No, it's it's the same. It, it's oh, the same. Right. Um, it, they they're just done by leagues. Right. Funny enough, actually, you mentioned Argentina. There, it's it's probably 
I'm not saying easier. It's just as likely now for someone to sign because the GBE, a South American based player, right. than than in certain countries mm. in Europe. Uh, yeah. Which I think you, you've seen it over the last probably eighteen months. There's there's been a couple of South American players signed for England, and and I think it's the market's probably only going to get bigger. Logistically, that brings in its own problems, but you, it's opened up the South American market. Yeah, yeah, so that's it. Yeah, I mean, we Sunland have just we brought in the Costa Rican, so it must if we yeah. And so, how does that link to then the? Let's see, the World Cup's coming up. Will you be watching? I know you're not going to be signing the the the, the top the top um, Brazilians and stuff, but I'm sure there's players that are playing in the in certain teams that would be you know definitely achievable for for QPR to sign. Are you got presence in terms of watching those games? Do you have scouts on hand to to do reports on certain players? Yeah, we 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 won't be going. Well, I won't be going to the to the World Cup, uh, but in terms of that, but there are certain countries we we will be keeping an eye on. Um, mm. Just I mentioned it earlier, they might play in lower leagues, but they are going to the World Cup, so that that yeah. classes the band one competition. So, yeah, they their points will jump dramatically, um, and and then obviously I would imagine tip most of them over the fifteen points mark. Um, yeah. So there are there are there are countries we will be keeping an eye on. We it will be mainly from video obviously from a logistical point of view it's yeah. there, there won't obviously there isn't going to be many countries we we trying to sign players from or want to sign players from but so it's logistically and financially it doesn't it's not very viable for us to take <clears> off to Qatar and watch watch the world cup so a lot of it will be done video and then you know if if we wanted to pursue that when they come closer to home if you like back into their respective leagues then um be something we'll pick up live. Yeah, sure. Cool. So I'm cautious of time and you know I've been on now, so I will get get through these. So um next question really is what in terms of working in sport, obviously a lot of people that watch this are either just interested to know what goes on in sport, the students and they're looking to forge a career in sport. So from your perspective, what's the best thing about working in sport that you found? What what things do you enjoy the most about it? Um I, to be honest with you, I, I enjoy near enough most of it it's uh it's it, it is a job obviously and it's a it's a it's a very time consuming job in in any job in sport really i think people mm. don't necessarily appreciate how how time consuming it is you you miss a lot of people's birthdays and celebrations and and go on going forward really because obviously if you're in a sport where the weekends play it's your weekends are it's not the time where you can say, well, I can't, it's mm. somebody's birthday, I can't work, because mm. for football, it's game day. Um, so, yeah, the, the, I, I'm i very fortunate, I can only obviously speak for myself, I'm, it's something I I do a job that I love doing, mm. uh, in a sport that I, I love watching, uh, mm. in terms of that, so it's, from from my point of view, it's, it's a passion probably more than more than a job yeah uh, as i say I'm, I'm very fortunate and appreciative that it's something i, I can do um and something i'm allowed to do um yeah I, in terms of students in terms of probably trying to get into it i think it, certainly from the analysis point of view and even the recruitment side of it now because obviously the recruitment analyst role the yeah. data analyst role you see jobs advertised on a weekly basis, really, it seems at the moment, uh, for recruitment analysts, data analysts. I think I saw one the other day. Was it a set piece analyst came out the other day? Yeah. Uh, um, so there's more and more jobs coming up. I think I think the, the biggest thing is, and, I, and I'm sure you probably agree with this, is when you're coming out, similar to what, what, what you did, when, you, when you're coming out of university or even before that, try and gain some experience. Uh, yeah. And contact clubs. Um, most clubs will will uh, certainly contact, uh, get back to you. They might not always be able to help, but they they will mm-hmm. certainly get back to you if they can. Um, try and gain experience. It's something that will probably separate you from a lot of people trying to get the jobs. Certainly, stress out of university. Mm-hmm. I think we touched on it at the start. Obviously, I went and did a masters. I think you needed to at the time. Mm. that seemed to supersede most things yeah 
I might be talking out of turn, but I'm not, I'm not sure it does anymore. I think I think the experience, for me anyway, is the experience right. is much more vital. I if 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 we advertise for a role, I would be looking more at the experience column than the academic yeah. column, really. Um, so I, I think the biggest thing I can say to people watching is if you're um, tr- try and gain experience, contact clubs, and that doesn't matter what level of the pyramid. Mm. It, it doesn't matter whether it's lower down the pyramid, going and filming games and doing bits of analysts. And, and that way, to be honest, you might get more face-to-face contact time with the manager or the yeah. coaches, which mm-hmm. rather than being uh, a smaller cog in a bigger wheel, really, if you like, yeah. there's nothing wrong with doing it the other way around. And, you know, certainly lower down, I'm sure they'd welcome the help. Yeah. Uh, and, and that might be something for, for people to do. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree with the whole experience. And again, I'm not there to dispel masses. I'm sure they're very valuable. But again, if I was looking at how to pick the two, it would be, you know, have have they got experience? Um, in terms of the scouting experience, I, I feel like it might be a little bit. I'm at, again, I don't. I'm not a scout, but in terms of harder to, just because I feel like if you're looking to employ a scout, you need to have that. It's maybe harder to get the credibility. So, like analysis, I can go to a club and just film and code the games and maybe share things with the, the coaches but with scouts it feels like that comes with a lot of years and years of experience and you might not be taken seriously at the start um i mean for people that are wanting to do that what would you say scouting per- specific andy in terms of if they wanted to be a scout and gaining that you know the the initial step when they're not taken seriously maybe or or things like that yeah that 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 is that will be harder. That that is harder. Uh, um, in terms of in, in terms of trying to get into it, whether I, I know it's obviously analyst role, but the recruitment analyst might be a way in. I, I know there are companies that uh, umbrella scout, if if you like, uh, yeah. where where they where clubs outsource to them, uh, and you, you see a few job adver- advertisements about that. Um, yeah. That might be a way in. Um, in terms of that, so you're you're not necessarily doing it for a club as such, but mm-hmm. you're doing it for a company, and they're building up scout reports, um, yeah. which are then going to clubs. So fundamentally, that might be a way to build up experience. Um, but uh, you don't know if you don't ask in, in terms of that. So so contact clubs. Yeah. Uh, what's the worst they can say? That no, no, thank you. We we we're already full. Yeah. Yeah, very true. If you, I'd like to think we would be. Most clubs will be polite in their response. Yeah. It's somebody who's trying to, and to be honest, with you, if there isn't anything there, it's there might not be straight away. It, it might be six months down the line. Oh, okay, so I remember getting an email about that, or yeah, or that, or or you bump it, you then get something, and you bump into that person at the game. Mm-hmm. And then again, like I said earlier, you've probably already made the introduction without having made the introduction. Yeah. So, yeah, just contact clubs and ask. Yeah, definitely networking. And like I say, if you combine the scouting experience with analysis again and put these kind of content out, you kind of, with the analysis, you're showing your understanding of the game as well, which is obviously going to add to the credibility of your any scouting reports that you're doing. So, um, okay, that's that's perfect, Danny. I mean, just a quick, quick question I do ask, you may or may not have any. Do you have any, other than this podcast, do you have any recommendations for any podcasts or books that you're into if you have any time to consume anything it doesn't have to be sport football just just anything really uh the the, the honest answer is pro- probably not i'm i'm people i'm not a big podcaster in terms of listening to to be honest i unfortunately when i'm traveling a lot of my time is spent on the phone really <laughs> in terms of that and i would love to sit down and read it read a book and i was trying to think actually the last couple of books i read it was well, I'll probably know. It was, I think it was the XG philosophy, I think, or and mm. football hackers, and yeah. and that it was those types of of books. Um, really, a, that's just me not being able to switch off, really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I would, I would love to give loads of recommendations for for books, but uh, no, I think in terms of if if you if if you're fortunate enough to end up working in professional sport i think it's also important to try and have some downtime as well because it can be it can all be very time con- uh, consuming and all 
all consuming of your life really to be honest so yeah. i think it's time it's nice to try and uh have a bit of downtime Our time switch off definitely so appreciate that andy i mean just looking at the league table qpr just think just outside the playoffs obviously long way to go that's your obviously target to get promoted i would say so we'll be keeping an eye out on the the results see if you bring anyone in in um in January, who knows? I don't know. You probably put the work in already. Um, anything else you want to add, Andy? Anything? Anything at all? Uh, no, I think that's that's it for me. I think uh, hopefully people found it uh, useful. Um, and and yeah, if I can help anybody in any way, then yeah, I will. I will try my best. Perfect. Well, if anyone's got any questions, they can leave them in the comments below. Um, reach out to me, or you know, obviously Andy's on on LinkedIn as well. Um, but yeah other than that very much appreciate your time Andy have a great day and I'll catch up with you soon thank you cheers thank you